hppodcraft.com. The Colossus. Chapter One, The Flight of the Necromancer. Southern France, 1281. In the medieval city of Vion, a great cathedral gleams in the boiling dusk. From a neighboring hill, a tall, twisted mansion's shadow stretches unnaturally over the building. We descend into the overgrown gardens behind the evil manor house, where Mr. and Mrs. Daring, thieves, lurk through the ornate shrubbery. Shh! Don't shush me! That screech out of the manor belfry, flapping into the sky. I thought you said there was no one here. No, I said I heard that the necromancer Nathair and his ten devil-given pupils had departed suddenly and secretly, perhaps leaving behind furniture of satanic luxury and strangeness. I didn't say anything about bats. Shh! Let's have a peek inside. Don't shush me. The two thieves tiptoe toward a broken stained glass window. From inside, we see them peering through the glass. Their eyes go wide. They burst into the crowded city tavern. It's It's empty. empty. We cut to the tavern a few rounds later. Locals surround the two as they hold court from a table, an ornate wooden chandelier dangling above the room. No furniture, no books, not even a spoon of satanic strangeness. All gone! Doubtless to the same fiery-born as Nathair and his ten devil-given pupils. An angry dad with bright red hair speaks up from the bar. Hey, one of them devil-given pupils is my son, and I'm not the only one who have lost a good boy to the unholy tutelage of Nathair. He may have gone astray, but the Lord tells us to forgive. Looks at bartender. People? Debts? All sorts of things. The bartender frowns. A naysayer chimes in. Do you really trust these two known thieves? It is patently impossible that Nathair and his ten apprentices, with several cartloads of household belongings, could have passed the ever-guarded city gates in any legitimate manner without the knowledge of the custodians. A custodian pounds the bar next to him, drunk. And I saw nothing. A cleric stands up from a table. You who saw nothing are lucky. The thieves are correct. The house is empty. And I personally witnessed the flight of the necromancer. We flash back to blue moonlit skies over Nathair's mansion. A legion of bat-winged assistants carried them away bodily. A flight of men-like shapes upon the blotted stars, together with others that were not men. Ebony, winged creatures ascend from the tower, clutching the human figures of Nathair's pupils. The cleric stands on a street outside of the Vion Cathedral, looking up in fear as the creatures caper over the rooftops, launching from the city walls toward an amorphous shape stretching from the stars to meet them. I heard the wailing cries of the hellbound crew as they passed in an evil cloud over the roofs and city walls. The cleric crosses himself, then bends down to pick up the small dog he'd been walking, hustling away. Back at the tavern... This was about, oh, two weeks ago. Pure fantasy! There are bats that fly from that belfry nightly. There is no magic in it. It's true. I saw them tonight. An apothecary emerges from the bathroom, followed by a peasant who wipes powder from his nose. Somebody might have already said this, but Nathair and his pupils probably transported themselves from Vion through their own diabolic arts to some unfrequented fastness where he can die in peace. Die? Nathair? Why is Fiend begotten, like the fabled Merlin, his father being no less a personage than Elastor, demon of revenge, and his mother a deformed and dwarfish sorceress? From the former, he takes his spitefulness, from the latter, his squat, puny physique. Uh, Stop your mouth, naysayer. Nay! Lothair is powerful, but he has long been in feeble health. This he has kept hidden, but much is known to the apothecary. One of his pupils frequented my shop. 
procuring different healing powders, as well as the first two illustrated volumes of the Apothecary Mysteries. I should mention I am working on the third. Oh, now I see. You were just feigning interest in my work while I measured out your powders. Get on with it! See? Witness my ability to create suspense! He wants to hear more. Anyway, this pupil of Nathair's, an ugly boy with bright red hair. Hey! We see the tower of the mansion open up against the night sky, and a giant brass orb of rotating rings and lenses emerges. He told me that Nathair had lately cast his own horoscope for the first time in fifty odd years. The figure of Nathair walks out onto a platform within the astronomical wonder, staring up into the stars. He had read therein an impending conjunction of disastrous planets, signifying early death. Cosmic explosions reflect in Nathair's eyes. He hopes to die in such peace and serenity as might be enjoyed by one who stands between the flames of the auto de fe and those of Abaddon. Back at the tavern, the apothecary does indeed command the attention of the room. For do not doubt, his departure has been prompted by fear of ecclesiastical thumbscrews and the stake. Nathair has incurred the reprobation of the church countless times, and their inquisitory zeal is unmatched this year. They're really having a good one. Other than Nathair, there are no sorcerers of any repute left unexecuted in all of Averon. Now wait just a minute! An elderly man, the Enchanter, steps out from the shadows in beat-up old wizard robes. He said, of any repute, Enchanter. Nathair has retired from the public view somehow, yes. But merely so that he might commune without interruption with various coadjutive demons, and thus might weave unmolested the black spells of a supreme and lycanthropic malice. He didn't just move away or anything. He's still around. And these spells will in due time be visited upon Vion and perhaps upon the entire region of Averon, and will no doubt take the form of a fearsome pestilence or a wholesale involtuation or a realm-wide incursion of succubi and incubi. Werewolves or sex demons? Here we go again. It's always one or the other. But you never see any werewolves or sex demons in town. Do you? I drove the werewolves out of Vion in my youth and dealt with the sex demons at great personal cost, boy. Don't underestimate my power. The naysayer stands. You know, I've listened to everybody spew nonsense night after night in here, but nothing is worse than boasting about your old haunted orgies, you drunk. The naysayer pulls a dagger from his belt. Let's start dealing in facts. If you're such a powerful wizard, enchanter, then stop this dagger! He makes to throw the blade when, crack, the chandelier animates and lunges down from the ceiling, grasping the naysayer like the talons of a claw, lifting him into the air. The crowd gasps as his knife clatters to the ground. What the hell? Oh, God, run! Enchanter! Gaspar Dunord, a handsome young sorcerer, steps out of the shadows, clutching his hand in the air. I was going to let you take credit for this, you old fool. He opens his hand, and the chandelier draws back to the ceiling, releasing the naysayer who crashes to the ground. If Nathair is gone, it is good. Why indulge in somber gossip and lurid speculation? Gaspar drains his cup and places it on the table. He shakes a pouch from his belt over his palm. A few beans and one small coin fall out. He glances up at the bartender, who waves him off. Gaspar leans down and grabs the naysayer's dagger, tucking it into his belt and nodding at the enchanter. As he exits, we see a young girl's eyes watching through a window. Outside of the tavern, the girl, Aggie, approaches Gaspar as he steps out. That was quite something, sir. Magical. Gaspar looks her over suspiciously, then relaxes. You know, I thought so too. Thank you for saying that. You're welcome. I haven't seen you around here before. Visiting? No, I live at the edge of town. This was a rare luxury for a poor student. A lot of lines on your face for a student. Have a good night. Wait! You're in luck! Because tonight only, I'm offering a student discount. She pulls a long rope. A metallic grinding sound catches Gaspar's attention. 
From the shadow of the tavern, a clockwork reanimated horse, Magnifique, lurches out into the open, a wooden cart hitched to it. It marches toward them, clicking rhythmically. What is that? Magnifique. He's my horse. Or was. He died. What did you do to it? My dad and I took what was left and got it running again. It's a clockwork thing now. It actually smells nice. Like leather. Huh. Well, you're very clever. But I'm very poor. It's free. That's the discount. Gestures to the tavern. If they see you do it, they might try it. I don't want to go into the family business, okay? We cut to a long, dark dirt road. Aggie steers Magnifique from the cart, Gaspar sitting behind her, the horse chugging and whirring along. Gaspar whistles softly, and a will-o'-the-wisp appears on the roadside in the distance, lighting it in ethereal blue, dissolving before they meet it. I wish I had a sorcerer with me all the time. It gets awful dark when there's no moon. Although there's a full one coming, and that can be just as bad. Gaspar whistles again. Another wisp appears down the path. Uh, they're only wisps. In the old days, people stumbled upon the right whistle and thought they were summoning light from the very air. But now we know that it's only a mating call that the wisps respond to. Oh. They're some kind of animal? No, they're ghosts. But it's not magical light or anything silly like that. Only common ghosts. So you're a scientist? I am. You're Gaspard, the hermit who wastes all his good looks studying. My sisters talk about you. They say you're a student of Nether the Necromancer. I was. Let's not revive the memory. Nether imparted much rare and peculiar knowledge to me, but I chose to withdraw from the household after learning the enormities that would attend my further initiation. He does things with dead bodies. I prefer not to talk about it. He's been tolerated because he assists in furthering this town's dubious affairs. But when he first arrived, he was stoned in public for his brooded necromancies and permanently lamed by a well-directed cobble. He never forgave that injury. They mock him, but he possesses remarkable power. A mesmeric persuasion. His vanishment is a providential riddance. I stuffed this horse and made it run again. Does that make me a necromancer? No, no, no. You've made a clockwork, and a quite good one. Nether would rend the horse's spirit from its peaceful grave, enslave it, make it do the work of your gears. His power comes from the breaking of things. Oh, no. It's better to fix things. Too many men like Nether hoard knowledge and use it to their own selfish ends. I endeavor to create a great volume of knowledge, the summation of many lifetimes' work, so that people can be free of destructive creatures like him. That's quite noble, to sacrifice your youth and society for others. <laughs> Sweet child, don't be so naive. Once I'm done, I'll use my magical knowledge to travel to the far future, a time and place much less disgusting, and reap the dividends of my nascent science. <laughs> These idiots here are on their own. What does a ghost mate with? Cut to a small house built against a craggy tree. Gaspar waves to Aggie as she steers her horse away. Bye, Aggie. Remember that information I gave you? Bye. As she disappears into the night, he hears a footfall up the path, a clanking and stumbling. He turns and whistles. A wisp appears, illuminating a zombie knight clad in armor but with a giant split in his shoulder shambling across the road. The thing hisses at him from half a face. Gaspar draws his dagger, but it turns away and lurches off as the light fades. Cut to Gaspar's attic. The large room is sparsely furnished, but crammed with books, lab equipment, and curious knickknacks. An oblong mirror framed with an arabesque of golden vipers rests on a table. Gaspar seats himself in front of the mirror. Show me the whereabouts of Nether. The reflection of his face dissolves into a vision. Wizards conjuring over a giant fuming cauldron. The shape of a shadowy demon grasping a man's writhing body. Two huge stone vats, steaming, bubbling, about to tip over. A cloud passes across the mirror, and then a flash. Gaspar shields his eyes. The mirror dulls. Isterel. Isterel appears in the mirror, a beautiful young creator of magical artifacts. 
This clouding can mean only one thing. Nathair knows himself watched and has put forth a counterspell that renders my clairvoyant mirror useless. Were you watching me, Mr. L? No. You called me. Well, but how did you know what I wanted? Nathair has been clouding a lot of mirrors, Gaspard, but I'm not even sure who this is. Who is this? I have to go. Another flash, and the mirror goes dark. Chapter 2, The Gathering of the Dead. Gauzy gray sunlight hangs heavy on the gates of a gothic graveyard outside the walls of Vion. Aggie's horse chugs to a stop as Gaspar jumps from the cart, approaching the sexton. Thank you for coming, Monsieur Dunord. I'm not one to rouse a recluse unnecessarily, but after what you did at that tavern... You thought I might help you too. I'm curious, but... I don't know if I can do anything. Could you pay my driver? The sexton approaches Aggie and hands her a few coins, nervously studying the clockwork horse. Is this how all sorcerers travel? Hmm? Uh, sure. Where are these graves? The sexton leads Gaspar to the middle of the cemetery, where six graves have been opened, the coffins aslant or protruding from the ground, shattered into fragments. Gaspar holds a cloth up to his nose, masking the stench. They were found early this morning by the gravediggers, six of them newly occupied by reputable citizens. The corpses have vanished utterly. Gaspar inspects the scene. Were there any eyewitnesses to their fate? None. We've dealt with grave robbers in the past, but they're after trinkets, not entire bodies. This seems highly... Uh, devil-ridden. Gaspar approaches one of the graves, leaning in but keeping a distance. In these devil-ridden times, only one explanation of this happening seems credible. Demons have entered the graves and taken bodily possession of the dead, compelling them to arise and go forth. And so forth? No, go forth. Uh, walk around on their own. The coffins have been shattered from within as if by the use of extra-human strength, and the fresh earth itself was upheaved, as if the dead men in some awful, untimely resurrection actually dug their way to the surface. Crossing himself. What do we do? Hmm? Oh, I don't know. Build a fence? I, you know, although keeping them in might not be a good idea either. Maybe it was a one-time thing. I wish you luck. He reaches out to pat the sexton on the shoulder, but just sort of pats the air and walks away. That's it? The sexton chases Gaspar down as he returns to the gates and mounts his cart, Aggie starting the horse's engine. But surely there's some spell, some way to make them return. There is a way, yes, if you can find them. Can you find them? I, I knew these men. They were my friends. I'm sorry. I'm just in the middle of a huge project. It's not... I mean, I'd like to help, but let's go, Aggie. Aggie pulls levers and the horse moves. The sexton shakes his head, then walks away, cursing. The girl steers the horse and it turns to follow the sexton. What are you doing? I need to turn it around. You couldn't have done that while I was in the graveyard? The sexton notices Magnifique at his heels and jumps. Are you following me with that thing? I'm so sorry. We're just giving it a... Be done in a minute. We, we have to turn it around. Sorry. A long, awkward moment as the horse slowly turns around. The sexton stands there, watching them, angry. Sorry. Finally, we cut to the road where the two have gotten some distance from the cemetery. Gaspar looks back as the sexton stands outside the gates, watching them go. Is he still there? Yes. Maybe you should help him. Okay. Well, did he pay you? Yes. Great. That was the actual purpose of the trip. See? Now we're even. Don't get me wrong, he seems very nice, but I don't want to get involved. I have my own work to do. People just assume because I'm a sorcerer. I get it. Gaspar watches as the sexton closes the gates. Later that night, in Gaspar's attic, we find him pleading with Isterel in the magic mirror. I don't want to get involved. Neither do I, which is why I'm only asking you to have a quick look around Everon, see if this is happening elsewhere. People just assume because I make magic mirrors that I'm watching everybody all the time. Uh, most of my mirrors aren't even magic. This is my family business. 
We have mirrors all over Abbey Rome. Your talents are legendary, trust me. When Nether gifted us with these mirrors, he warned us of your glamours. How you made your appearance beautiful in order to sell more inventions when we ask for assistance. It's because of these obvious talents that I'm coming to you now. Nether told you that? Nether told us that a sorceress of your specialties could create an appearance tailored to our specific desires, which you clearly have, but that it was only masking a grotesque, monstrous appearance underneath. His words. That's not my feeling about it. I'm not the type of person who values appearances. I enjoy talking to you, and I would even if I had to look at it. At it. At you. At how you really are. I'll see what I can come up with. We cut to an interior room of the crystal tower in which Isterel works. She watches Gaspar's image fade out in her tall, oval mirror. Reveal, Isterel looks exactly as she did to Gaspar. Hmm. Another reveal. Behind her is a huge bank of magic mirrors, displaying a supervillain level of surveillance on the towns, villages, and hamlets of Aveyron, both large-scale and intimate. Okay. Let's see what we can see. She turns to gaze into the smoky glass and we dissolve to a magic mirror montage. In a moon-soaked churchyard, zombie arms and legs spring from freshly dug graves. It is much worse than you feared, Gaspard. In the two weeks since you said those nice things to me, an occult summons has been laid upon the dead throughout Aviron. Various zombies climb out of the ground and burst from mausoleums running off into the countryside. Nightly, the cemeteries have given up a ghastly quota of their tenants. From brazen, bolted tombs, from shallow, unconsecrated trenches, from the marble-lidded vaults of churches and cathedrals, the weird exodus goes on without cessation. At a funeral, a group of mourners gather around a decorated wooden framework supporting the coffin of a distinguished man. Worse than this, there are newly ceremented corpses leaping from their beers and running with great bounds of automatic frenzy into the night, never to be seen again by those who lament them. The deceased blasts out of his coffin to the horror of his mourners, dusty and rotted, yet still distinguished. The undead thing growls and scampers away. We cut to a modest hut where the enchanter sits on his patio, ladling a drink from a cauldron. In every case, the missing bodies have been those of young stalwart men who died through violence or accident rather than wasting illness. A naked zombie jogs toward the patio. The enchanter sees him and holds up a second glass invitingly, but the naked man just runs by and ignores him, a giant gash in his back. The old and infirm, it seems, are safe from the animating demons. The enchanter looks down, sad. Across the countryside of Aveyron, we see hundreds of zombie men running rampant through fields and towns, all headed one direction. The general direction of their flight is eastward, Several hundred of them. We fly around the heavy metal majesty that is the evil castle of Elorn in the eerie green light of the moon. Rumors have sprung up that their destination is the ruinous castle of Elorn, beyond the werewolf haunted forest in the outlying hills. A great craggy pile built by a line of evil and marauding barons now extinct. A place that even the goat herds prefer to shun. Back in Gaspar's attic, the young wizard paces in front of his mirror. No one cares to dwell in the shadow of its cliff-founded walls. And the nearest abode of living men is a small Cistercian monastery, more than a mile away on the opposite slope of the valley. Oh, so you've heard of it. My brother is one of the monks in that monastery, Bernard. I fear Nether may be building an army of the dead. But Bernard has the power of the church behind him. Perhaps he can deal with this. He is a man of great perception. We cut to a carrot patch in the terraced gardens below the monastery, sunny and pleasant. Bernard du Nord, a happy-go-lucky young monk, hoes weeds with Stefan, his ambitious roommate. Bernard notices a carrot lying on the ground and grabs it. Stefan! Yes, Bernard? This one looks like an icicle. They all look like icicles. Oh, right. I guess I'm always looking at it the other way. Look, don't tell me about any more special carrots, right? Unless there's an image of the Virgin Mother or the Lord himself on it. That's the kind of thing we need to get the abbot's attention. 
Maybe the icicle's made of holy water. No, just put it down, Bernard. Bernard stares at the carrot. (sighs) Now you want to eat it, don't you? Because I told you to put it down. No, I was only thirsty from working. It's not literally an icicle now, Bernard. Give me the carrot. Bernard pulls away, notices something in the distance. That's a rare sight. Stefan follows his gaze. Pale, well-dressed men are striding toward them at great haste across a wide clearing bordered by haunted woods. Huh. They seem to be in a hurry. Dressed nicely, too. What? Is there an event? Bernard takes a bite of the carrot. Stefan slaps it out of his hand. What did you do? Why weren't we invited? Crackling sounds from the woods. A few dozen more zombie men break through the trees. Maybe it's a race. Stefan looks around, suddenly frightened. There is nowhere to hide. We should, we should run. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Go. Go. Go! Excited, Bernard takes off running. Stefan follows. A second later, Bernard charges back to the patch and grabs his carrot from the ground. And leave the bloody carrot! Huffing and wheezing, Stefan chases Bernard up the steep hill toward the humble monastery. Behind them, the horde of zombie men gain ground. Stefan stumbles and falls to the ground. Bernard skids to a halt and turns. He sees the zombie men more clearly and frowns, then runs to Stefan. Bam! A zombie farmer with mold covering his body collides with them, and they all fall to the ground. More running zombies trample and leap over them. The monks manage to roll away from the growing marathon. They watch as the runners mount the hill. They crawl to the edge of the hill and behold the obscene procession headed into the valley toward the castle of Elorn atop the opposite peak. Cut to a monastery hallway, in which the abbot strides toward a door to the roof, Stefan and Bernard jogging behind him. Yes, you are not the first to report such strange scenes. They emerge onto the monastery rooftop. Theophile, a stout monk, sits on a crenellation, drinking a bottle of wine, looking out over the valley. Theophile had a vision near Elon last night while herding. The horrors he witnessed have caused him to make over-frequent visits to the wine casks today. Bernard goes to the monk and touches his shoulder. Theophile looks up at his friend. Theophile, not drinking again. There were flaring lights where where lights should not have been. Uncanny blue and crimson. Hideous noises, anvils and hammers. Brimstone and burning flesh. The place has been occupied from beneath by subterrestrial beings. Well, they're probably getting it already. There are people on their way there right now. We just met them. Bernard points just as the horde of zombie men appear in the valley, rushing toward the castle. Teofil whirls to see. God in heaven. An army of monsters. Bernard returns to the others as Teofil stretches over the edge to see the running undead. We must redouble our toil and austerities. This is the Archfoe's activity in our neighborhood, yes. But since the old castle is a place abandoned by men, it would be well to mind our own affairs unless there is overt satanic hostility. This is for the Lord to sort out. As the abbot nods, Theophil tumbles soundlessly over the crenellation in the background. All three monks turn slowly. From below, we see them looking down over the monastery wall. Reveal, Teofil's body lies twisted on the ground. It looks like he broke his neck. The abbot straightens up, looks at the two monks. I'd like to keep this quiet. Of course, Father Abbot. But poor Teofil! We don't want it to get out. He was back to his old shame. Why don't you gather up his body and have a small private funeral? Just the two of you. We'll say he ran away. Just the two of us? Brother Bernard, a two-person... Secret funeral is the highest honor a monk can receive. Bernard looks to Stefan, who nods. He deserves it. The abbot smiles. I like you two. Listen, I'm sure the other monks might be a bit disturbed when they see the horde of running men. For now, I have them cloistered in prayer. Help me keep them calm until it passes. We shall double our toils, Father Abbot. The abbot pats him on the cheek, pleased. Later that day, in the monastery chapel, Teofil's body is laid out on a table. Bernard kneels on the floor before him, praying quietly. Quite suddenly, Teofil sits up, his head lolling horribly on his broken neck. Bernard jumps to his feet. Teofil! The corpse stands, looks around as if confused, and then hastily runs from the chapel. 
Moments later, Bernard emerges onto the rooftop again and runs to the edge, Stefan following. But what is it? Bernard points down into the valley. Look, Teofil really ran away. We don't have to lie to everybody. In the distance, we see Teofil running toward the growing horde of zombies, his head bobbing around weirdly. Lord, help us. A number of other monks crowd out behind them suddenly. What's going on here? Hey, everybody, come look at all this crazy satanic stuff out here. It'll really freak you out. Stefan frowns at him as the monks crowd around for a view. In the valley, we see hundreds of zombies shamble run toward Elorn, storm clouds gathering around the ruined castle. Chapter 3, The Testimony of the Monks We see Bernard's image in Gaspar's mirror. His face is bruised. I can't deal with this. Reveal Gaspar in his attic, sitting across from the mirror. <sighs> what happened next, brother? We flash back to the monastery chapel, where Bernard and Stefan sit in a pew, the abbot glowering down at them. Thanks to you, the men are now irked by these flagrant signs of evil and desire someone to visit the ruins with holy water and lifted crucifixes. We are but humble monks. Yes. All the more impressive that you've applied for permission to avenge the abduction of Theophil's body, as well as the taking of so many others from consecrated ground. Stefan glares at Bernard. We applied for that? I marvel at your hardihood, you lusty monks, who proposed to beard the arch enemy in his lair. But I give you permission to go forth and drive the evil from Elorn. Thank you, Father Abbot. Just the two of us? Oh. The abbot leads them into a small workshop, the walls lined with various swords and axes. A hunchback is busy at work. We will, of course, furnish you for your challenge. Oh, great! The abbot crosses to a table and lifts two large, ornate crucifixes. He hands one to Stefan. These are great crosses of hornbeam. Hmm. Feels kind of light. It is the only weapon a servant of God needs, my son. These are not men you face, but demons. With faith, you are invulnerable. You do have faith, don't you, brother? With all my heart and soul. I'll take a mace. You could bring in a knight with that one up there. Ah, but pay attention, Brother Bernard. These crosses have a special feature. Look, it appears to be just an ordinary crucifix, but when you hold it up like this... Yes? What? You can smash somebody with it right in the head. Watch! He pretends to hit Bernard with the cross in slow motion. Oh, wow. We cut to Stefan and Bernard tromping through the desolate valley to Elorn, carrying their crosses. Can't believe you got us into this. Just think if we actually clear the place out. You've been wanting to impress Father Abbott for ages. This is just the thing. Yeah, I wanted to impress him with me austerity. He sent us out to die. But maybe you're right. We do have God on our side. When you have, like, faith, God fights all your battles for you, doesn't he? That's the whole point, isn't it? Maybe this is a blessing in disguise. Boy, that'd be great, wouldn't it? What? What do you mean? I don't necessarily go in for all this God stuff. Bernard, you're a monk. Yeah, I like being a monk. The gardening, the singing, the low expectations. But the rest of it seems a little silly. <gasps> Such blasphemy! I'm simple. It's probably all just over my head. Teofil did come back from the dead after all. I didn't see that one coming, so who knows? The two struggle over the precipice of a hill, revealing Elorn a short distance away. There is no evidence of occupation or activity. The two monks approach the castle. The deep moat that once surrounded the place is dry and partly filled by crumbling earth and detritus from the walls. The drawbridge has rotted away, but the blocks of the barbican collapsed into the moat have made a sort of rough causeway on which it might be possible to cross. It's impossible to cross. But Bernard is already climbing on the stones. This way, don't touch the floor. It's an empty moat. Stefan looks down at the skeleton of a giant moat monster, the legendary Tarask. Thank God. He steps onto the stones and sways dangerously as they cross. They enter the deserted courtyard of Elorn. Nettles, grass, and sapling trees grow from the paving stones. The massive donjon, the chapel, and the great hall have preserved their main outlines after centuries of dilapidation, but the place is a ruin. 
Over there. He points to the left of the broad bailey, where a doorway yawns like the mouth of a dark cavern. A thin, bluish vapor writhes in phantom coils from the great door, partially ajar. The men look at each other, then hold up their crosses. Right. Go ahead. The sunlight blinds them momentarily as they enter the castle. As their vision clears, the scene reveals itself. They are standing on the threshold of a colossal chamber made by tearing down upper floors and inner partitions, details revealed in shafts of sunlight. As they take it all in, a shadowy, gigantic demon flies down into the space, dropping coal into the top of a furnace. The monks hide behind a column and observe. A man-sized demon tends to the furnace. Next to him, a familiar breathes fire across the coals. Everywhere there are immense pear-shaped vessels brewing and steaming. Several other demons hover over a great fuming cauldron, chanting and waving their arms. Against the opposite wall, there are two towering stone vats. Bernard and Stefan are unable to see more than a whitish glimmering from one and a ruddy luminosity from the other. Bernard squints through the smoke. Between the vats, he can just make out a low couch made of luxurious, weirdly figured fabrics. Sitting imperiously atop the couch is a small man in robes, very pale, surveying the work with cold, flaming eyes. Nathair. Stefan pats Bernard on the arm and points. Near them there is a pile of corpses, together with a heap of human bones that have been wrenched apart at the joints. Great lumps of flesh are piled like the carvings of butchers. A pupil with bright red hair, red, lifts a pile of bones and drops them into a cauldron, beneath which there glows a ruby-colored fire. Another pupil, squat with big ears, flings lumps of flesh into a hissing tub filled with some hueless liquid. As they work, two tiny demons are stripping the grave clothes from one of the cadavers, and one produces a long knife. Bernard recognizes the corpse, Theophile. Without hesitation, Bernard steps out of hiding with his cross. Everybody, stop what you're doing! This is the church! Nobody even notices over the din. A scurrying demon almost knocks him over as it blows across the vast room, speedily alighting the stone stairs along the walls of the immense vats and emptying a vessel of semi-liquescent matter over the high rims. Stefan rushes out and grabs Bernard by the shoulder. Okay, you did it. Now we need to give them time to respond. Let's go. We need to get Tailfield. Across the room, Nathair's shining eyes alight on the monks. The sorcerer points a finger and shouts in a strange tongue with a shrill, imperatory tone. The pupils and demons all turn to look at the monks. The man-sized demon flaps down and lands in front of them. Listen, give us the body of our friend there and we'll go and you can take your time moving out. Right. <clears throat> this is your moment. He takes a deep breath and steps forward. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and with all the power and grandeur of God's light, I command thee, demon, to return to hell! He plants his cross firmly on the ground before the demon. The demon tilts his head curiously, then slaps the cross away like a toy. Yeah, it's all bullshit. Made a huge mistake. Run! He turns, but the giant demon descends to block the exit. When he turns again, red lunges at them and flings a thick liquid into their eyes. Everything goes red. Cut to Gaspar's attic, where he listens to Bernard describe the scene from the mirror. We were blinded by the fluid. It really stung. And then I passed out. How did you escape the fate of the others? Well... You saved me. Cut to black. We hear the voice of Nathair. Arise. A blurry outline of Nathair on his throne. Stefan and Bernard climb to their feet, their hands bound behind them. Bernard falls. Demon laughter rings out in the huge chamber. He climbs to his feet again and shakes his head to see Nathair sitting atop his luxurious throne, bemused, the fire in his eyes at bay. These are the great crusaders sent from the monastery. (laughs) Come before me, 
Red and Big Ears push them forward and Bernard falls again. Stefan pulls him to his feet. What is your name? Brother Stefan. Hmm, brother... <laughs> brother Stefan. An adult man. Somebody told this adult man that there is an invisible sky father with a mysterious plan for him, and he believed it so much that he's dressed like this. That thing with the, the hair, the bald spot, that's on purpose, you know. He agreed to that. Oh, the Lord works in mysterious ways. You must suffer, but it is not for you to understand. You will be rewarded only sometime later, after you're broken and spent. And the more you suffer now, the greater the reward. Trust me. <laughs> These are the words of pimps and slavers. I've heard them in various iterations my entire life. Never more than in the mouths of holy men. Mouths that wriggle and shake while their hands touch and steal. He looks to Bernard. What's your name, handsome? Bernard de Nord. <gasps> Not Gaspard de Nord's brother. You know him? Hmm. Unlike me, Gaspard has always been very popular. Shame he hasn't been able to see what we're working on. Nathair looks up and speaks a strange set of words. A demon descends into the room and flies toward Teofil's body, entering the corpse's nostrils inch by inch until its horned and bestial head is withdrawn from sight. Because you are Gaspard's brother, I'll allow you to return to your kennel. Teofil sits up, his head bobbing. Another demon hands the zombie one of the horn beam crosses. And take with you this message. Back in Gaspar's attic, Bernard passes the message along. They that came here as many shall go forth as one. An army, just as I feared. And then another demon flew into another body, and that guy had a huge wound right here with his guts all hanging out and uh, ropey parts. No, I don't need to know those details. Flashback to the exterior of the castle, Bernard and Stefan running for their lives in slow motion. Behind them, reanimated Teofil and a nude, disemboweled zombie emerge from the door, swinging the hornbeam crosses high in the air as they give chase. They beat us with our own crosses all the way home. Look at my back! In Gaspar's mirror, Bernard reveals his back, covered in bruises. Gaspard flushes with anger. My little brother. Bernard pulls his robe into place and sits. It reminded me of when Dad beat you with your own ponytail. It was that humiliating. Yeah, okay. What did the abbot do? Cut to the monastery chapel, where the abbot is surrounded by monks. We will face this menace with triple austerities and quadruple prayers. Hey, Bernard and Stefan are seated in a pew, looking at each other in disbelief. Back in the attic... I don't want to be a naysayer, but I think we need actual help. Yes. It is clear to me now that some gigantic menace, some black infernal enchantment is being brewed within the ruinous walls of Elorne. This malign, moribund dwarf is all too readily identified as our missing sorcerer, Nathair. And as underlings, it is plain are Nathair's pupils. Still, maybe there's a way for me to stay here and- Chapter 4, The Going Forth of Gaspar du Nord. Chateau du Nord, a richly appointed manor house in Vion, gleams in the morning light. Inside, Gaspard kneels before his father, the Marquis du Nord, who sits on a high chair flanked by racks of ceremonial spears. His mother, Lady du Nord, and his sister, Sephora, sit on either side of him in all the trappings of nobility. I have to go. There's no other way. Your brother gave himself up to the care of the church. Why should I pay to take him back? I have seen in the stars the foretokening of a great evil that is to come upon all Averon. But the nature of the evil must still be discovered. I have no desire to travel the many miles to Elorn, but it seems I must, and at speed. Oh, I didn't realize stargazing was involved. Let me get my wallet. Will you return from the study of this doubtful science and take your rightful place as my heir? <sighs> I will. And I will immediately bequeath my powers and possessions to my sister Sephora. And I accept, Gaspard. Marquis du Nord gets to his feet, seething with indignance. My friends laugh at me. The Marquis storms out of the room. You shouldn't mock him. 
Others suffer for it. She rings a bell. A servant enters with a cloak and spear. The Marquis will not allow me to help my son, but by his mercy I am allowed to give you the cloak and spear you left behind. The servant holds the cloak and Gaspar nods to her, slipping into the garment. The sound of coins. He places his hand against the pocket. It is a pittance. Thank you, Mother. He takes his spear, nods to the servant, looks to Sephora. We'll be together in the future. He leaves. Not long after, Gaspar approaches the Vion Tavern just as the Enchanter is leaving. Oh, Gaspar! Fortune is with me. I'm looking for the girl with the horse, Aggie. Yeah. Have you seen her? Uh, the girl? Oh, she's out of business. Uh, she was taken home by Grandpapa. Now, I wanted to thank you for your kindness. The Enchanter produces a red gold ring with a purple gem. This... Is the Ring of Iban. Gaspar takes it absently. Uh, thanks. Did you say her grandpapa? N no, grandpapa, the pimp. Well, let me tell you about that ring now. Why did a pimp take her? Aggie has a family business. Sisters. Oh, you, boy, you're not too bright, are you? Well, that's why this ring is just the thing. It has come down from ancient Hyperborea. In the gem, an antique demon is held captive. And she will answer the interrogation of sorcerers. She'll answer any question truthfully now. And I hereby bequeath her to you. The ring glows in Gaspar's hand. Oh, great. Where is Aggie? The enchanter puts his hand over it. I can answer that for you. No need to use the ring. Behind the outhouse, there's a long straight path all the way to the creek. It's not too far. Nobody designed it, but a lot of men worked on it over the years, let me tell you. And not me, of course, because I went down with this succubi and incubi. I, as you know, I can't... Thank you very much, Enchanter. He pockets the ring and storms past the old man. Well, you well fine. A short time later, Gaspar emerges from a dusty path through sparse woods into a clearing along a narrow creek. A series of small huts line the bank of the creek, one wide cabin in front with a patio and small bar. Two goons stand at the bar. Grand Papa reclines on a patio chair. Hello there, sir. <laughs> Welcome. I'm here for Aggie. Oh, well, then I'm here to serve Aggie. He whistles loudly. She's out messing around with that weird horse, as usual. <laughs> Bring Aggie up. Dorothy steps out of the hut. And the horse. Oh, he wants magnifique, too. <laughs> he pours himself a drink from a large jug. Dorothy nods and heads off down the creek. Believe it or not, it was actually the horse I bought. Quite an oddity, huh? A lot of good deals after that pestilence last summer. The town asked me to take Aggie in on the deal. Blacksmith's kids are so, you know, not fit for a good home. So, I did my civic duty. <laughs> we hear Magnifique in the distance. Gaspar turns to see Aggie and Dorothy approaching along the creek. She's clean, though. No pestilence. Probably already know that. Prostitutes peer out on the scene from the various huts. You're that sorcerer from the tavern, right? A fancy hermit. Boys and I were just talking about you. We were wondering what exactly you can do. Magic-wise. You haven't been snapped up by the Inquisition, so is it just chandelier magic you do? <laughs> well, with the right preparation and materials, I can do all sorts of things. But you're right. On my own, I can only animate simple objects like the chandelier. I can push people away if they get too close. That's important. Generate heat. I, I could boil a small amount of liquid, for example. Grandpapa looks at the goons. <laughs> a small amount. <laughs> oh, my. So, just for the sake of our conversation, then, do you think you could take Grandpapa in a fight? You? Yeah, sure. Certainly. All, all three of you. <laughs> Aggie draws closer, worried. And how would that work? I wouldn't have to use magic. I spent my whole childhood training with this spear. I could disable you without having to touch you, which is the one thing I am afraid of in this conflict. But I have a long trip ahead of me, and a physical fight would be tiring, so a quick act of 
chandelier magic just might deter the others and get me on my way faster. Hello, Aggie. Aggie steps up to him, the horse grinding to a stop. Hello. All of this is, of course, academic. I have money. Gaspar produces the pouch of coins from his inner pocket and tosses it on the patio to Aggie. I need Magnifique for a journey. Whatever's in that pouch might be good enough for the horse and the cart. Might even be good enough for the girl for an hour or so. But she's mine. Gaspar ignores him, still looking at Aggie. Aggie, would you like to leave this place permanently? Yes. Hmm. Do you have any family left? She shakes her head no, placing her hand on Magnifique. Very well. There's more than enough to cover your losses in that pouch. She's leaving with me. I'm not some drunk naysayer magician. I'm Grandpapa. Boys, the two goons lift their swords. Here we go. Seems like this isn't academic anymore. Crack! (laughs) With a twist of his hand, Gaspar animates Grandpapa's chair, and one of the legs blasts up through his thigh like a stake, spraying blood into his face. Disgusted, Gaspar makes a shooing motion, and the chair begins dragging the screaming pimp away across the patio. The goons turn to Gaspar, clutching their swords. Before you guys bother, the the small amount of liquid I can boil? It can be eyes. I can just boil your eyes. Don't make me do it, please. Both goons drop their swords. It's only a job. These girls are my friends. I I don't need all of this. Prostitutes and Johns emerge from the huts, the naysayer among them. Dorothy snatches the money from the patio. This is mine. I'm in charge now. Gaspar looks at the men. That's fine with me. I would love that. I would actually prefer that. Great. Good. Well, good luck then. Everybody have a good day. Aggie? She starts the horse. Gaspar climbs into the cart and they chug off down the path. The naysayer turns to his prostitute as the other women stalk toward their screaming ex-pimp. When he said naysayer, was he talking about me? Is that how people really see me? Aggie drives the cart along a path. Some time has passed. I hope you'll forgive me, sir. I know you needed that money. It was a pittance. And it's unthinkable that a person of your obvious talent should go uneducated. I need people like you. Working, thinking, building the shoulders of giants for me to stand on in the future, where no one will need face the depredations you just narrowly escaped. Uneducated? Are you taking me to Nathair? Nathair? No, no, of course not. But that's where we're going. To Elorn. No, that's where I'm going. Oh. Well, just so you know, I'll take you wherever you want. And then don't worry about me. You've done enough. I can take care of myself. I won't get in your way. Aggie, you've shown me the way. Gaspar reaches forward, placing his hand on her shoulder. Aggie seizes his hand, squeezing it tightly, closing her eyes against tears. Gaspar whistles and a wisp appears on the darkening path. Travel montage. They pass the familiar old cemetery as they leave gated Vion. We'll avoid the forest for now and follow the river through the open, well-peopled plain. They travel along the glistening river, across a landscape dotted with small, distant farms. By morning, we should arrive at Moulin, where there is a small artifactory. A rustic town with a narrow, silvery tower on the outskirts. I've befriended a hideous creature that works there, Isterel. It's a long shot, but she and her family of monsters may be able to help. Gaspar and Aggie stand before the front door of Isterel's tower. He smiles down at her and then lifts his hand to knock. Isterel opens the door before he can. Yay, you're here. I'm so excited. We know everything and we're in. Hello, Aggie, I'm Isterel. She leans down and tussles her hair. You're going to have the time of your life in there. Go in, go. Um. Gaspar nods at her. Aggie smiles and walks into the tower. Isterel and Gaspar look at each other. She curtsies in her silvery sorcery robes. He is stunned. A pleasure to finally meet you, Monsieur du Nord. You're so... beautiful. Thank you. I don't normally wear these for work, but I knew you were coming, let's be honest. Your face, your expression, the way you burst through the door with so much life. 
How do you do it without the mirror, this glamour? Isterel blushes. Gaspard. He reaches out slowly, then taps her on the cheek. She slaps his hand away. Hey. I'm sorry. I thought maybe you were smooth or something. I'm an artifactor in a family artifactory. You're thinking of fairies with the fake glamours, pixies. This is what I actually look like. What? Isterel frowns at him, unsure if he's for real. She turns and goes inside, leaving the door open. I've made a huge mistake. Gaspar walks inside the tower, dazed by the immense warehouse-like room contained within. Along the walls are mirrors of all shapes and sizes, broadcasting the goings-on of Averon. Several incredibly good-looking artifactors wander about in leather aprons, ignoring him, crafting mirrors and imbuing small items with magic. One artifactor adjusts several compact mirrors, all displaying different scenes. Another animates a stone gargoyle, and it flies off. At the end of a long table, an artifactor clutches a javelin. It glows green and coils up tightly in his hand like a whip. He places it on the table and grabs another javelin. Gaspar is amazed. An older man, Jehan, approaches. Gaspar de Nord. I'm so happy you've arrived. Jehan bows before him. I am Jehan, Isterel's father and owner of this artifactory. We pulled it here brick by enchanted brick from Zymes almost 20 years ago. If you do find out how Nathair affected his swift departure, please let me know. Or you know what? Don't. Thank you for your hospitality. This is... You're spying on everybody in Averon. Oh, uh, no, this is just... testing to improve our product. <laughs> Gaspar sees a group of artifactors sitting around a large mirror, watching the image of the custodian picking his nose while on gate duty. Jehan steps in front of him. I must admit, however, we've kept a close eye on you. We saw what you did, and we agree to take Agatha in. I can't pay you. Pay? You've given us a gift. He gestures to the artifactors, all teens and young adults. My children are growing up. Some wish to leave. I won't refuse them. He leads Gaspar toward Aggie at a table with Isterel. We know you are journeying to investigate Nathair's plans, but there is a complication. Isterel touches a mirror on the table, and a hologram-like image of Averone pops up in the air. For years, the werewolves have stayed at bay hiding in small covens throughout the Great Forest. She waves her hand, and the map narrows in. You can follow the river to Elorn, but you must pass through the wildest and oldest portion of the Immemorial Wood. And preceding you have been hundreds of walking werewolf meals. It's become impassable. In the hologram, we see the horde of zombies passing through the dense forest. Blurry werewolves sweep through the crowd, ripping and tearing at the bodies. Their bloodlust has risen, as has their strength, and tonight is the gathering of the full moon. Where did you have a mirror in the forest? How did you get all of this? We had time to create a little dramatization. You were taking forever. That's why we now have to travel at speed. She taps the mirror and the image fades. I'm going with you. The gathering is the perfect time to smuggle you through. Jehan smiles at her, sad but proud of his daughter. I've grown up near these woods. I know their customs. I know their language. I've got a plan. As the day grows long, Gaspar and Isterel approach the edge of the woods. They stop and turn to each other, geared up in cloaks and werewolfy furs, Moulin in the distance behind them. Wolves travel from all of Aviron for the gathering. It's not rare to see a stranger. So we'll walk the river and keep to ourselves, blend in. Only a couple of werewolves in town for the big party. Gaspar puts his hand on his spear, now coiled like a whip on his belt near a few pouches and his dagger. Isterel checks the grappling hooks, compact mirrors, and short sword on her adventuring belt. If we don't make it out by night, and we likely won't, we can hide in the treetops while they transform. I'd like to avoid that, but we'll have to leave now. They nod to each other and cross the threshold.
Chapter 5 The Great Lowering Forest Shafts of daylight cut through the dusty air, immense trees, clinging mists, ghostly sounds in the atmosphere. Gaspar and Isterel walk along the riverbank, a large space between them. He steals a look at her. She catches him and he turns away, concentrating on the path. An awkward stretch of silence. I'm... I'm embarrassed. You shouldn't be. I admit it. I spy on people more than I should. But, but, but I'm very sheltered. In my family, the tradition is to strike out far and wide when you're old enough. But before then, it's the tower and not much else. If I did peek into your life, it's only because you're mysterious. And that's a good thing. Most people are all over their mirrors all day long. I mean, I've seen some things, let me tell you. I was talking about the misunderstanding about the glamour and how you look. Oh. I thought maybe that was a joke I didn't get. I'm just not very experienced. That's okay. Neither am I. I mean, I've seen some things too. I chose to be sheltered, to see the world through books. But because of that, sometimes in life, I read things wrong. He turns to her. I feel it's best to be direct. I'm afraid of doing another stupid thing. And that fear is obviously connected to a desire for you to fall in love with me. Oh. Well, I like you too. But I'm also just leaving home, so I worry about settling too fast for the first shiny thing. Yep. Hey, me too. I also fear attachment. Don't get me wrong. It's not like I don't know what else is out there. I'm inexperienced, but I've seen a lot. Most people are really disgusting. I feel the same way. Wait, I have a ring. That's what I meant by too fast. <laughs> no, no, it's a ring that a friend gave me. Gaspar removes the ring of Abon from a pouch. Uh, there's a demon inside of it, and if you ask it a question, it has to answer truthfully. Oh, that makes much more sense. He places the ring on his finger and it glows. I await your question. Cosette, a tiny red demon, appears in the ruby like an evil Tinkerbell. How many can we ask? Wait, 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 wait. Let me out and you get five. We have to be careful. Demons play tricks. I just want to ask one simple question. Demon, will Isterel and I fall in love? Really? If the answer is no, we can relax. The answer is yes, but only if you let me out. Oh, only if we let you out. Yep, that's her answer to everything. Let me try something I know the answer to, just to see if it works. Uh... Is Gaspard a virgin? <gasps> Let me out and he won't be anymore. Gaspar puts the ring away, shocked. Uh, I'm not sure if that's an answering questions, demon. Well, obviously he gave me the wrong ring. You are invasive. I thought we were being direct. Hello there! They turn to see Jacques Le Luc Garou standing near. A brawny, bearded man in a nobleman's fine hose, tunic, and cap. Why are you guys dressed like werewolves? Gaspar freezes. Isterel steps in front of him. What are you doing? Are you howling at me? Gaspar leans in behind her. That's knowing the language? Wait a minute. I know what you guys are up to. As he steps in close, we see his yellow eyes, long nails, and the pentagram charm around his neck. He sniffs at them. You're pretending to be something you're not. Gaspar's hand creeps along his belt toward his spear. You're pretending to be wolves who turn into humans instead of the other way around. Wolf wears, right? <laughs> My mother used to tell me those old stories, but I know it's all bullshit. <laughs> he clasps their shoulders roughly. You guys are just regular old werewolves, eh? That's right, regular werewolves. I knew it. But why not get dressed up for the party? This is so basic. Is this your first time? No, we've done this before. Oh? He's a little embarrassed. 
It's the first time for both of us. I knew it. Well, come on. Don't be embarrassed. I'll take you right to the center of the action. You are now the exclusive guests of Jacques Le Loup Garou. They look at each other, then back to Jacques, smiling. Later, the three walk together along the river. And the fire is burning really high, and, and right then you throw the last piece of clothing in. Ah! You know, embrace the beast! But wait for the elders. You just watch me. When you see me naked, you'll know it's time. We'll look forward to that. Hey, I enjoy that chance to help somebody. The guy who wore these clothes? I killed him. Not when I was a wolf, either. I killed him just like this. You know, a regular guy killed. Wow. I know. It can get you down. All the killing. But enough of that. We're here to have fun. And I'm not going to let you two out of my sight. Mm -mm. Come on, I know a shortcut. Jacques dashes into the woods, away from the river, and disappears into the mist. Isterel touches Gaspar's arm. We need to get out of here. He suddenly appears behind them. What are you waiting for? Come on, you two, let's go! Le Loup Garou pushes them forward. Cut to even later. As the three continue their trip through the woods, Gaspar and Isterel notice silhouettes creeping in the mist around them. And that's when I became Le Loup Garou, the famous highwayman. I know it's on the nose for a werewolf, but you know what's ironic? My name is actually Wolfgang. <laughs> Other voices laugh around them, snarling. Finally, they emerge into a large cleared space, wood stacked in the center for a bonfire. The day is waning. Around them everywhere are werewolves in their human forms, clustered in small groups, dressed in finery. Ah, here we are, the scene of the crime. You know, a lot of werewolves will tell you to be fashionably late, but I did that the first time, and this guy in front of me kept standing up on a stump. His rear end was in my face the whole time, even when he transformed. That part stays pretty much the same, you know, so really boring. Ooh! Stay right here, I see this guy I tried to kill. He'll have a good spot for us, one second. Jacques scrambles off toward the bonfire. Isterel pulls Gaspard back toward the trees and then wraps her arm around his waist, studying the distracted partygoers. We should run. She looks into his eyes, pulls a grappling hook from her belt, and points it in the air. It shimmers and blasts into the tree, hooking and zipping them up through the branches to the treetop. Crash! Rope retracts into the grappling hook as the two land in a thick grouping of branches far above the party. Gaspar grabs the tree to steady himself. What are you doing? Nobody was looking. I had to take the chance. She deftly climbs toward a break in the foliage and looks down at the clearing where Jacques has returned and is searching for them, confused. She climbs back and starts securing their position. It's closer to the fun than I wanted, but we'll have to camp up here for the night. Help me. He swats at a cloud of gnats, almost peers down, then stops himself, nauseous. More time passes, and the site is now packed with werewolves in human form, mingling and dancing by torchlight while musicians play. Far above them, Isterel and Gaspar have managed to make a narrow hammock between the tops of two trees, both sitting precariously with their backs against opposite trunks. Isterel peers down. We should sleep in shifts. With this noise, good luck. You know, actually, I think I have some sleeping powder from the apothecary. He pours a tiny bit into his palm and leans toward Isterel. I'll stand guard first. Just take it like snuff and it'll put you out for a couple of hours. She pinches some and sniffs it, then sneezes immediately, <laughs> blasting the powder up into Gaspar's face. Another jump in time and the werewolves have begun the festival. They lock arms in three concentric circles around the fire and sing. The circles contract and expand as the wolves move in, throwing clothes on the fire and dancing back into place. Up in the treetops, Gaspar and Isterel are both fast asleep. Gaspar fidgets and rolls over, tipping the hammock. In the clearing, the werewolves rotate around the circle. The world is darkness. Crash, crash, thump! <clears throat> Gaspar plummets from the trees and hits the ground hard in front of the fire. Everybody stops dancing. He climbs to his feet, groggy. 
Crash, crash, thump. Isterel hits the ground behind him. Uh oh. Jacques steps out from the inner circle. Hey, what are you two doing? I was looking for you. Werewolves can't climb trees. <laughs> These are the craziest werewolves I've ever met. Come on, squeeze in with me. He lunges forward and pulls the vaguely conscious Isterel to her feet, then wraps an arm around Gaspar. Before they know it, they are in the circle with Jacques, which begins moving again with the music. Burn a human life in the fire. They throw clothing in the fire. Gaspar and Isterel look at each other, then throw their jackets in. Burn a human soul in the fire. More clothes are thrown into the blaze. The full moon breaks out of the cloud cover, shining bright in the night sky. The werewolves begin spinning in circles, dancing frantically, twirling with Gaspard and Isterel. They look at each other and laugh despite themselves. This is pretty fun. They mimic the dance, clapping and jumping along with the group. Jacques jumps in front of them, naked as promised. It's time! <laughs> Sklitch! Long nails shoot from his hand, while yowling and grunting as the werewolves dance and chain shape. Muzzles elongate, eyes glow yellow, howls ring out. Isterel and Gaspard continue the dance, mimicking transformations, howling and twitching absurdly, slowly edging out of the circle. Nobody seems to notice as they dance to the outskirts of the party, then turn and dash away into the forest. Nobody except Jacques, mid-transformation, who snarls with suspicion. Moments later, our heroes plunge through the overgrown woods in the remnants of their fur costumes, branches tearing at their flesh. Where are we going? This way. We need to hide. Isterel stops short before slamming into Jacques, suddenly in front of her, still in a Wolfman-esque transitional state. Where are you going? They back away. Three more werewolves emerge from the woods behind Jacques, fully transformed into canine-headed monsters. Uh, we're just self-conscious. We wanted to change in private. You're humans. Gaspar steps in front of Isterel and holds his hand up. Wait! If you come any closer, I'll be forced to hurt one of you. Jacques <laughs>, laughs and steps forward. Gaspar waves his hand. The werewolf shrieks as his eyeball bubbles and pop. He yelps in pain and covers his face. Gaspar turns away. That should put an end to things. Jacques drops his hands, blood oozing from the eye socket, lifts his head and howls angrily. Maybe not. Scores of howls respond in the distance. Isterel dodges out of the way. Gaspar pulls the coiled spear from his belt and it glows, snapping straight with a satisfying clang. He twirls it over his head expertly. Stay where you are! Two more werewolves pounce on Gaspar from the woods, tackling him to the ground. Jacques leaps forward and joins the pile. Isterel desperately searches her belt. No! Food. The werewolves blast out into the air as Gaspar pushes them all away with an explosion of magical force. The other three werewolves attack. He spins the spear and swipes the legs out from under one of them, then rolls on the ground to avoid the other two. He thrusts at them aggressively with the spear, parrying their clawed swings and keeping them at bay. But Jacques and the other two wolves join them to make five, and the upended werewolf is getting to his feet behind him. He is surrounded. A compact mirror suddenly slides into the middle of the fracas. Blue light shoots out of it, and a gigantic 20-foot bear appears with an axe, roaring savagely at the wolves, its eyes smoking and gleaming. Yelping in fear, the monsters turn and scatter into the woods. Gaspar sees Isterel scoop up the compact as the image of the bear dissolves, and they run. The two crash through the brush randomly, panting. We intercut with glimpses of the growing horde of werewolves chasing them through the trees. In a small clearing, the heroes dash through a pond, and Gaspar trips, splashing into the water. Isterel runs back to help him. She looks up to see dozens of yellow eyes emerging from the trees, the woods churning with werewolves. 
She pulls a grappling hook from her belt and Gaspar clutches her. She aims it at the trees and they zip up just as dozens of werewolves emerge into the clearing. Whap! Gaspar smashes his head into a branch as they come to an awkward stop halfway up the tree, both grabbing on for dear life only 20 feet above the ground as she fumbles the grappling hook. We intercut with the pack gathering underneath as the hook falls to the ground. Full werewolf Jacques emerges in front of the pack, his eye socket trickling blood. I want to go home. Gaspar thinks, then reaches into a pouch. On the ground, Jacques places his hands on the tree trunk, howls, and begins shaking it. The other wolves join him. In the tree, Gaspar produces the ring of Abon and shakes it. It glows, and Cosette appears inside. I await your question. Will you help us escape? The answer is yes, but only if you let me out. With a sudden lurch, the two are tossed from the tree and fall to the ground yet again. Jacques towers over them and howls, preparing to feast. Gaspar closes his hand around the ring and squeezes. Poom! Ruby light explodes and the werewolves shield their eyes, backing away. The light fades and Cosette flutters up from the broken ruby in Gaspar's hand, still Tinkerbell-sized, looking innocent. Gaspar shrugs at Histerel. It was worth a try. Jacques leans over and sniffs the demon. He lifts a taloned hand and flicks at it, but Cosette flutters out of the way. The werewolf laughs. Cosette turns to Gaspar. Thank you. You've given me my freedom, and now I give you yours. She bows, then begins flying in a circle, faster and faster, until she becomes a whirling ruby saw blade. The wolves tilt their heads in confusion, unsure what to do. The demon saw zips forward. Buzz, buzz, buzz. Werewolves yelp as Cosette cuts through the group, severed limbs flying up into the moonlight. The wolves flee as the demon wreaks havoc, Gaspar and Isterel running in the opposite direction. The two crash through the edge of the forest into a wide grassland, the monastery and the valley to Elorn in the distance. They sprint wildly, looking back at the woods. They slow down as they see that nobody is following. Half-naked, covered in sweat, they fall to the ground. Panting, they begin to laugh, rolling onto their backs. Gaspar reaches for her hand. She takes it. They lock eyes, then roll into each other and kiss. Werewolves howl, and we see Cosette shoot up from the treetops against the full moon in a shower of ruby sparks. Fade to black. Chapter 6 The Horror of Elorn. The chill, malignant fires of twin stars burn in the dark. By degrees, the stars dissolve into the eyes of Nather, his pale facial features rising from the chaotic murk. Welcome. Reveal, Gaspar is seated against a large swath of tapestry, his wrists bound, giant chainmail links hanging around him. His shoulder is bandaged. He blinks, disoriented. So, Gaspard de Nor has come to see his former master. Gaspar winces as the necromancer returns to his luxurious low couch, wheezing. Demons and familiars work at the large luminous vats in the background, drifting to and fro in the shadows. Not there. What happened? What is the last thing you recall? Isterel. We escaped the woods, the werewolves, we... we... Ah, you've forgotten quite a lot. A symptom of the Tarask's venom. Quick flashes of a horrific moat monster attacking. <sighs> the Tarask? Let me fill in the gaps for you. You survived the night with your companion in the great lowering forest and were reunited with your sweet brother at his monastery. Flashback. A crow lands on a crooked tree, observing Bernard as he emerges from the monastery to embrace Gaspar. Bernard holds his brother at arm's length to have a look. He and Isterel are half-naked and tussled. This is Isterel. 
Bernard bows to her. The crow flies away toward Elorne. No doubt you witnessed his brethren, busy about groveling and shrieking, incoherent pleas for protection from the arch fiend. Bernard leads them into the building, converted into a makeshift military barracks. Monks practice fighting with swords and shields. Badly. Stefan steps up to meet Gaspar, covered in chainmail and war paint, holding a large mace, accompanied by the hunchback. This is Brother Stefan? Not just Stefan. One name, no bullshit. Later in the chapel, they huddle with Gaspar, who holds up a compact mirror. I'll use this to communicate the size of the threat to Isterel, but I'm going to confront Nathair alone and try to reason with him. You and the monks are the first line of defense should he refuse to stand down. We'll be ready. Stefan cocks his mace. Somehow. Back in the castle of Elorn, Gaspar looks down at his empty belt. Your possessions are here with me, including your lady's magic mirror. You lied to me about Isterel. She's not a monster. Uh, perhaps. I run a school for young men. One must minimize distractions. But I didn't lie about her deceptive nature. In her culture, one is not allowed to leave the artifactory unless one has found a replacement. Did she tell you that? Or did you think your orphan problem was solved so handily? Gaspar looks queasy. Nathair holds up the compact mirror. When one watches from above, it is not difficult to pull the strings. She played you for a fool. If your looks bear credible witness, you are mortally ill, Nathair. And the time is short in which you can atone for your deeds of malice. What foul and monstrous brew are you preparing? And what have you done with the dead bodies that were stolen by your familiars? Nathair tosses the mirror off into the castle. It shatters. You and I have both been engaged in the miracle of creation. He lifts his arm and the room fills with light. Reveal, Gaspar sits inside of a 100-foot-tall skeleton. The macabre framework is complete in every part, with ribs like arches and great finger bones curving claw-like on the floor. Loose chainmail armor adorns the torso, and Gaspar is seated in the tapestry that bedecks the pelvis. The teeth are set in a cruel grin, the eyes seething with myriad lights as demons creep in and around the skull. They that came here as many shall go forth as one. You mean to animate this colossus? Yes! Yes, I do! You encountered our proof of concept on your way, the Tarask. Flashback. Gaspar emerges from the valley, exhausted by his climb. He sees the rotted drawbridge, the blocks of the Barbican, and begins mentally mapping his crossing when... Dust plumes from the moat. Gaspar extends his spear. The Tarrasque roars out through the grimy cloud, a dragon-like beast of 25 feet that moves like a dinosaur, albeit with long primate forearms and a spiky shell along its back. It releases a broken shriek and charges at Gaspar. I'd prepared a lovely breakfast in anticipation of this spectacle. We see Nathair on the broken tower far above, sipping tea, munching a croissant, a crow alighting next to him. Gaspar waits as the monster charges him, then drops onto his back at the last moment. He pushes a telekinetic blast at the creature's jaw, forcing its head up to reveal a fleshy pink patch at its throat. Gaspar plants his spear on the ground and rolls away. Squilch! The body weight of the beast drives the spear straight through its throat and head, viscera blasting out in choking spurts. Nathair frowns and throws his cup to the ground. I'd forgotten how well you memorized the details of my bestiaries. Except for one thing. Gaspar turns around, proud of himself, just in time to see the tip of the Tarrasque's tail whip-snap into his shoulder. Back in Elorn, Gaspar winces. Blood seeps from his bandage. So much is made of the fiery breath and the spiky shell of the Tarrasque, everybody forgets about the poison tail. But as you know, I have a mind for detail. If you had remained with me, Gaspard, and had not drawn back in your petty squeamishness, it would now be your privilege to share in the creation of this prodigy. 
from the fresh bodies of the dead, which otherwise would have rotted away in charnel foulness, my pupils and familiars are making for me the flesh for this skeleton. I must die soon, it is true, for my doom is written in the stars. But in death I live again, and shall go forth endowed with mighty thews. This is madness. It is no madness, but a veritable thing. My soul, at the death of its present body, will pass into this colossal tenement through the working of certain spells of transmigration, and I shall go forth to visit vengeance on the people of Avaron, who have long hated me for my necromantic wisdom and have held me in derision for my dwarf stature. Nathair, it was I who lamed you. Oh? Flashback to the Vion Town Square. A loose gathering of angry peasants shout at a younger Nathair who cowers near the town's central fountain as stones are lobbed in his general direction. A boy, young Gaspar, nods to a couple of chums and lifts a flat, sharp stone from the ground, whipping it at the dwarf. Crack! The stone hits Nathair's knee, causing him to stumble and twist the leg in a sickening direction. He shrieks. I was a spoiled child. When I came to you for learning, I was also coming to you for redemption. In the castle... And like a spoiled child, you walked out when things became difficult. I refuse to shatter the peace of the grave with your necromancy. There may be no heaven, there may be no hell, but there is peace in death. You're afraid of the sight of blood. I have broken all laws of man and nature, so allow me to tell you, your plan to travel to the future is impossible. It's a willful fantasy that frees you from admitting you hate these disgusting animals. Foolish, cruel men. Deceitful women incapable of love. Rutting sloths in peacock feathers. Stripping them from the earth will please me to the very bones. It remains only to invest those bones with necrotic flesh and blood. Nathair claps his hands and red appears, his red hair matted with sweat. My good Gaspard, there's nothing whatever to be done with you, is there? Except to put you safely out of the way. Providentially, for this purpose, there is an oubliette beneath the castle. A somewhat dismal lodging place, no doubt, but one that was made strong and deep by the grim lords of Elorn. Red pushes Gaspar into a dungeon room, his hands still bound in front of him. There is a round grate in the floor. Ah! You don't have to do this. I remember you. I saw your father recently. He spoke of you. The pupil grabs a long hook and opens the grate. Oh, so you were at the tavern? Yeah, it was a tavern. How did you... Oh. He pushes Gaspar into the oubliette. From below, we see the circle of the opening, the pupil looking down. Somebody will be along to feed you. Maybe. The grate closes. Gaspar surveys his narrow prison, 12 feet high, 15 feet in diameter, roughly circular. Snakes slither in the slimy, mephitic pool at his feet. He stumbles back over a moldy human skeleton. The torchlight above fades to black. In the castle, construction of the Colossus nears completion. Bat-like creatures flit between stone vats and the giant skeleton, clothing the feet and legs with a glowing reddish plasmatic clay. Nathair, propped up by pillows, has gathered his ten pupils around his throne. They are clad in satanic scarlet robes. The flesh, well prepared, finds its new home. As will I, very soon. You! Students of the Scholar Mounts will complete the final litany for this transmigration. And as your reward, you shall travel with me to dispense wrath and inherit the spoils. The bastard princes of blasted Avaron! All hail, Master Nathair! Once you have completed this repugnant rite and I am reborn as a colossus, I want you all to climb into that basket over there. He points at an enormous basket outfitted with a harness, like the gondola of a hot air balloon. That's for us? That's what that's for? How do we all fit in there? 
thought we'd be riding the Tarrasque or in his hands or something. I shall place you upon my back, and you can throw rocks at people or whatever pleases you. It'll be great. You'll love it. They seem displeased, but Red steps oh, forward. It will be our pleasure to ride on your back, Master Nathair. Oh, not you, Red. What are you up to? You need to stay with Gaspard. But... Don't get sneaky. I gave you a job. Oh. Angry, Red storms away. Big Ears sneers at him. <laughs> Don't sneer at him, Big Ears. He has important work to do, as do all nine of you, my dearest students. I wish you farewell, Big Ears, as you attend the passing of this body. Farewell, Narrowhead, Gaptooth, and Limpy. Farewell, Unibrow, and smaller version of Unibrow. Greasy nose, chin divot. Keep our secrets. And you, Phil. So nondescript I had to learn your Christian name. Something very difficult for my satanic brain, as I've explained. You're very special as well. We begin to hear the satanic chanting of the pupils as the demons and familiars pour flesh over the bones of the Colossus. Drums keep pace as the enormous thighs are revealed, the mighty chest, stupendous hands, all glowing with life as the flesh seethes and sculpts itself into place. Giant patchwork tapestries hang from the waist and chest, gleaming rings of chainmail protecting vital areas of the huge body. We see the sleeping face of the monster, seen in profile athwart the pouring moon. Nathair's face, remagnified a hundred times, twisted with madness and malevolence. The drums halt suddenly, as the last of the large vats is emptied over the Colossus. Its fiery red glow dims. Nathair, surrounded by his kneeling, chanting students, suddenly takes a sharp breath, then collapses. The eyelid of the giant trembles like a great curtain. The outflung fingers, bluish as a row of corpses, twitch. The lungs of the Colossus expand as it comes to life. The eye opens, the hand clenches, the ground rumbles. At the monastery, Stefan and a group of monks crowd around the rooftop as the entire valley shakes. Bernard parts from Isterel to meet the crowd. She opens her compact mirror. Her father's image is within. I don't yet know the nature of the threat. Gaspard is in there. He- It doesn't matter. You must return home now. The girl has run away. The monastery shakes and a monk tumbles over the side, caught by Stefan and pulled back to safety. I'm not sure there will be a home to return to, father. Isterel points the mirror at the dreaded Castle Elorn. Abruptly, the walls of the castle explode outward, giant blocks of stone flung across the wasteland. The Colossus stands, waist-high above the ruins, flames mushrooming from combusting furnaces around his legs. Stefan turns to Bernard. You said it was an army! That was bullshit too! Bernard shrugs. Stefan throws down his mace and storms away across the roof as the Colossus turns toward the monastery, shaking out its long, wavy hair against the sun. Chapter 7. The Coming of the Colossus The cleric walks his small dog in front of the great cathedral of Vion, pausing to look up. A ruby comet scars the blue sky, moving slowly away from the storm clouds gathering in the north. It is a prophecy of bale and pestilence to come. The cleric turns to see an old woman next to him with a box of vegetables. Yes, disastrous portents. My dog's been sick for a week. He lifts the dog and cradles it. You're a little too familiar with that thing. I don't know you. I thought we were getting friendly. Well, that wasn't a very friendly thing to say. It takes a friend to tell you the truth sometimes. We keep dogs around under the table to clean up the scraps and to wipe our hands on their fur. Not to cradle like a baby or a lover. That's an unnatural omen right there. You're an unnatural omen. <gasps> the old woman gasps, scandalized, and storms away. <laughs> Shh, I know. 
My life is the worst. At the monastery, a monk screams as he is trampled to a pulp by a mob of his brothers. The abbot kneels before a cross in his opulent cell, praying. The ground rumbles. He clamors to the window. Outside, the colossus smashes another wall of the castle as he stumbles into the valley. Monks rush by the abbot's door. Bernard stops to look in. Father, run away with us! No, we must be courageous and pray. The laughter of the colossus rings out as the ground shakes. Red stumbles into the dungeon with a basket of food. From down inside the oubliette, we see the grate open and the redhead lowering the basket with a rope, holding a torch in one hand. Gaspard! Here's all your food! To hell with not there! I'm leaving! No response. The pupil drops the rope into the hole. You're on your own. Sorry. He turns to walk away, and the rope shoots out of the hole, wrapping around his leg like a tentacle. Ah! He's pulled into the oubliette with his torch. Outside of the castle, the Colossus lifts the skewered body of the Tarasque from the moat, crushing the monster, squirting viscera into the air. Its malignant eyes light up at the violence. It laughs, dropping the creature to the ground and setting forth into the valley, gaining confidence with each stride. In the dungeon, Red moans in pain as Gaspar points a slapdash skeleton bone spear at him, the torch in his other hand. Is there a secret passageway? Huh? Weakness in the walls? Tell me! No. The whole castle has fallen and this dungeon still stands. I was supposed to wait three days and then free you, you fool. Now we're stuck. There's nothing else for your rope to grab onto up there. What? He's doing all this for you. You think he didn't know you were the one who lamed him? You tried to make up for a mistake. He admires you, loves you, thinks you're the only one worthy of his gift. I didn't want to believe it, but he told me in a feverish delirium. This cruelty for me. He will slake his thirst for blood, yes, but in his wake, you will have a new world. He knows your stupid plan to travel to the future won't work. He has willed you all of his vast wealth and a blasted kingdom to remake as you wish, a place for your science to take hold. Averone will be yours, Gaspard. High above the valley, Nather's devil-ridden pupils hold on for dear life in their basket harness as the Colossus storms toward the monastery, laughing. The monster pauses to pick up a large block of stone from the shattered castle and hurls it. Isterel, Bernard, and Stefan urge fleeing monks through the front door as the building is rocked by the boulder. The Colossus approaches the monastery, looking through a window in the tower. He sees the abbot staring out at him. The abbot falls to his knees, praying. The colossus laughs, tears an immense rock from a hillside with both hands, and flings it at the monastery. The room caves in and crushes the abbot, blood spraying. Isterel and the monks run clear of the crumbling building. Bernard points to a green spectral glow from the woods. That's a rare sight. Crash! Ah! Magnifique leaps out into the clearing at a gallop, powered by swirling emerald energy, Aggie in the saddle. Aggie. Come on, Magnifique. Lightning fast, the horse gallops past them, leaving a trail of jade dust in its wake. Magnifique gallops down the valley toward the Colossus, which watches with glee as the horse loses its footing. Aggie is thrown, she and Magnifique tumbling down the hill. Seeing this, Isterel motions to Bernard and runs. Stay here. Stefan steps up to him, looking at the wreckage as the remaining monks flee across the clearing to the woods. What a waste. The gardens are still here. Stefan shakes his head at his friend. Isterel blasts a grappling hook down the slope of the hill into the valley. The rope magically goes taut, and Isterel vaults high into the air across the giant's view. She lands on the valley floor and combat rolls toward the felled horse, which whirs as Aggie attempts to right it. The ground shakes as the Colossus marches toward them. Isterel helps Aggie push the horse upright, seeing a blazing green jewel embedded in its forehead. You stole this from my father. The horse bursts to life. Aggie climbs into the saddle. Sorry, only room for one. She gallops off, leaving Isterel behind. The Colossus looks down as the horse weaves between its legs. Back at the garden, Stefan sees Isterel struggling. We should help her. She said to stay, and it's hard to take my eyes off these woods. Stefan turns to see monks running back in their direction. 
In the valley, Isterel gathers her grappling hook. The Colossus careens toward her. Howling erupts from beyond the monastery. The Colossus looks up to see tribes of fully transformed werewolves charging out of the woods behind the monks. He smiles and forgets all about Isterel. Stefan and Bernard cower as he leaps over the monastery and rushes toward the lupine rabble. The werewolves howl to each other, pointing at the giant. The Colossus laughs and dives forward into the meadow to meet the creatures, like a criminal diving onto a bed covered in cash. They clamber over his body, biting and scratching. He rolls, crushing them, picking them from his hide and dropping them into his mouth, gnashing as they yelp in pain. Back in the dungeon, Gaspar and Red sit together, eating from the basket. And you know what? I was so focused on how my one childish cruelty led to Nathair building a giant monster, when one small kindness to the Enchanter led to me being saved from werewolves by a demon. That is so true. Why am I spending so much time focused on the mistakes I made and not the things I did right? Same with me. I was ready to give up because I made a bad decision. But look at you. You don't need necromancy. I believe it. Although, I was actually going to ask you, did Nathair ever teach you how to use the spirit of a murdered man to levitate? Like levitate out of a out of a hole. Did he ever show you how to do that? No. Gaspard goes back to eating. Gaspard. Gaspard. Who's that? Well, that's another small kindness rewarded. You're lucky. Gaspard. Gaspard whistles softly. You mean we're lucky, right? In the ruins of Ilorn, a wisp flies past Aggie as she searches through the rubble. She chases after it. It zips down a stairwell. At the monastery, Stefan and Bernard help Isterel to solid ground as she climbs out of the valley. In the meadow, the Colossus climbs to its feet again, dusting the werewolves from its arms and charging into the woods. Smack! Ow! Gaspar falls back, rescued from the dungeon and then slapped in the face by Aggie. I'm sorry. I've set you free. Now we're even. I thought it was for the best. I didn't know. Can you throw the rope down? My family stayed together, good or bad. That was for the best. I'm still in here. I won't leave you again. Because you need transportation? Because you are family. Okay? I've learned a lot too. Help! Cut to the towering shoulders of the Colossus. Unibrow falls over the side of the rollicking basket on the giant's back, screaming as he plummets into the treetops. The Colossus does not notice as it lumbers through the woods. Big Ears grabs smaller version of Unibrow by the shoulders as the other pupils mosh around in the basket. Did you throw him over? Did you? Smaller version of Unibrow only smiles. Magnifique arrives at the monastery gardens. Aggie, Gaspar, and Red all astride the machine. We have to get back to Vion. The horse can be adjusted to fit more riders. I don't know if you noticed. Gaspar climbs down and crosses to Isterel as the monks gather. I can't go back. In the distance, they see the Colossus pull a huge tree out by the roots and strip the branches. Isterel, there was a time when I would have left it all in the fair and run away with you. Probably yesterday. Yesterday I would have done that. But because of you, because of Aggie, because of Red, I want to save Everon. Who's Red? I'm your brother. That's actually not my name. I'm sorry for what I did to you, Aggie. I got away with some good stuff. What else did you take? So Nathair told the truth. Aggie was your replacement. I used an opportunity to escape, but I love you, Gaspard. The demon was right. We fell in love. But if you do save Aviron, I need to get as far away as I can. My father sees everything. Gaspar places his hand on Isterel's cheek tenderly. She grasps his hand and they embrace. Cut to the two-bedroom thieves' den of Mr. and Mrs. Daring in the suburbs of Vion. Mrs. Daring sits at her full-length mirror, brushing her long hair. Mr. Daring paces back and forth behind her. You know... Darling, sometimes I regret all of the thieving we've done. An image of Jehan appears in the mirror suddenly. Shh, don't shush me. The ground rumbles. Everybody, Everybody needs to run, run away. away. The, the Colossus, Colossus is coming. coming. Run, run, now! Mr. Daring goes to the window. 
The Colossus appears in a flash of daytime lightning amidst gathering black clouds. He steps back, <gasps> shocked. What do we do? He turns and grabs her by the shoulders. I'm sorry for what I said. I don't regret anything. I only wish I could steal your heart away again. She puts her fingers to his lips tenderly. Shh. Rushing out of the clouds, the Colossus lifts his cudgel into the air and smashes it down on the thieves' house, splintering it to pieces. Nathair laughs as thunder crashes and more lightning strikes around him. This is no good. This guy's gotta go. Chapter 8, The Laying of the Colossus In a sparse forest, a stag sniffs at the ground, then freezes. It flees. Sounds of dogs and horses, and then the small hunting party of Pierre, the lord of La Frenaya, trots into view. The ground rumbles. Pierre raises a hand. Hold! His companions and their dogs halt. Pierre listens. Like footsteps, it's as if we, the hunters of the stag, have become prey of something much larger. His companions laugh. He raises his hand again. That sounds a little forced, eh? No. Crash! They see the giant approaching and ride for their lives. Pierre's horse breaks through the woods at a sprint, dashing toward his massive chateau. The Colossus plucks the lord from the horse, tossing him up into the air above his head. Whomp! Pierre lands in the middle of the basket on the giant's back and gets to his feet, pulling his sword. The pupils face him, unsheathing their own swords. I am Pierre, the Lord of La Frenée. I need not learn your names, or you will soon be dead! The pupils charge him resentfully. A sword fight breaks out. Meanwhile, Nathair has chased down the remaining three members of the party as they ride for their lives. He scoops the men and their horses up with one gigantic hand, squeezing them as he lifts them in the air. Squillach! He mashes them against the wall of the chateau, smearing them and flinging the bashed bodies aside. In the basket, the fighters swing wildly as they are rocked back and forth. Cut to Magnifique zooming through the woods, Aggie at the reins. He won't be able to resist that church. Just ride right past him. <laughs> right on cue, the Colossus spots the spire in the distance and heads toward it. As the giant turns, we see Magnifique break through the trees and gallop around him in the other direction, unnoticed. In the basket, Gaptooth opens his mouth and screams as Pierre runs him through against the side. Limpy shuffles over to attack, but Pierre flips him over the edge. As the others reach over to save him, Pierre vaults off of their backs and plunges his sword into the shoulder of the Colossus. Outside of the church, Nathair grimaces and reaches to snatch Pierre, holding him up, then whipping his body down on the spire, impaling him with a squirting splitch. I am still not there, you fools, and you will protect me or be crushed. The pupils are tossed about roughly as Nathair steps on a group of fleeing worshippers, then kicks the church. Cut to a small hamlet. We see screaming villagers gathering their children and fleeing the stalking monster. Big Ears and Phil throw stones over the side at them. Crunch! A tailor is brained by a rock as the cook he was running with is snatched by a giant hand. Nathair dangles the cook above his mouth and drops her in. Of the subsequent depredations of the Colossus, a hundred tales of unexampled ghastliness spread throughout Aveyron. Magnifique streaks along the river as the sun lowers. The Colossus lumbers across a farm, smashing a windmill. To and fro in a mad frenzy of destruction, like a death-drunken cyclops, he wandered all that day. Even the wolves abandoned their quarry and retired to their rocky dens. Jacques Le Loup Garou watches from the trees in his human form, missing an eye, bloody. He turns away. We see and hear as described. Men heard his mighty laughter. They saw his approach from a distance of many leagues. Lords called in their men-at-arms, drew up their drawbridges, and prepared as if for the siege of an army. The peasants hid themselves in caverns, in cellars, in old wells, 
and even beneath hay mounds, hoping that he would pass them by unnoticed. Outside the gates of Vion, Jehan's warning plays in a mirror as custodians rush to defend the city walls with archers and pike bearers. It would be tedious to make explicit mention of all the atrocities that were ascribed to the marauding giant. There were people, mostly priests and women, it is told, whom he picked up as they fled and pulled limb from limb as a child might quarter an insect. And there were worse things, not to be named in this record. In the Averon countryside, Nafer's giant foot smashes a cottage. Back and forth, in an irregular, drunken zigzag course, from end to end and side to side of the harried realm, the giant strode, leaving behind an ever-lengthening zone of havoc. Cut to the graveyard outside the walls of Vion. And when the sun, blackened by the smoke, burning villages had set luridly beyond the forest, men still saw him moving in the dusk. The sexton watches the giant silhouette in the distance against flashes of lightning in the sunset. He jumps as magnifique thunders to a halt next to him, wheezing, clanking, and smoking. My god! Sexton, I'm sorry to tell you that your friends are indeed returning. What? But I told you that I knew a way to bring them back, and I'm gonna prove it! Ha! What? I meant, ha! Let's go! Oh, oh, okay. What is that thing? It's the clockwork horse you saw before, but now it's magical! I meant that thing! He points at the Colossus in the distance as the horse lurches to life and gallops away. Thunder rumbles as they enter the Vion Town Square, barely noticed in the throngs of people running through the front gates. Entering the gates of Vion at sunset, Gaspard hoped that the monster would not invade the city the special object of Nathair's hatred and malice until the following day. It would continue to terrorize during the night, the outlying villages. In his dusty, overstuffed shop, the apothecary grabs a stylus, dips it in ink, and writes. Gaspar bursts through the door and the apothecary turns. Apothecary, we need your help. The only mystery at this point in my story is what took so long. A few moments later, the apothecary rushes around his shop, pouring powders into vials for Gaspar, who shouts instructions. We assembled various ingredients of alchemical use, which he felt offered the only possibility of coping with the fiendish monster. Outside Chateau du Nord, we see Gaspar's family gathering in a chariot leaving town. In Gaspar's attic, he mixes glowing chemicals as Aggie watches. Gaspar created a powder which he had seen employed by Nathair on numerous occasions. He reasoned that the Colossus, being formed from the flesh and bones of dead men unlawfully raised up, would be subject to the influence of this powder, which Nathair had used for the laying of resurrected liches. When the undead breed it, they return peacefully to their tombs and lie down in a renewed slumber of death. We need a lot of it. The sun rises on the Vion town square. Morning came with new terrors to Vion. Boom, 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 the sound of the Colossus approaching fast. Outside the gates, we see what once was Nathair charging wildly towards the walls of the city with his tree cudgel, covered in entrails from his murderous knight. Great boulders hurled from mangonels pelt him like gravel, and a heavy bolt from an arbalest embeds in his flesh, causing him to stop and shout, then rip it from his shoulder. Archers unleash arrows, but they do nothing as he squeezes the tower, crushing those not falling to their death. He throws the tower rubble aside, then raises his cudgel. With a single sidelong blow of the seventy-foot pine, he sweeps the men from the gate. Nathair throws back his head and laughs, then climbs over the walls into the city. Inside of the great cathedral, Gaspar and Aggie push their way through mobs of worshippers, both carrying enormous bags. They emerge onto the cathedral rooftop to see the Colossus smash the town square. The Colossus stops in front of his former mansion, across from the cathedral. Priests and devotees of a powerless god, come forth and bow to Nathair the Master before he sweeps you into limbo. Gaspar stands on the edge of the cathedral rooftop, holding his pouch, Aggie behind him, opening her bag. Nathair! The giant squints, recognizing him, the face growing near. You would have been wiser to remain where I left you, my good Gaspar. 
Gaspard reels at the giant's foul breath and draws a handful of powder. I wish you peace, Nathair. He throws a handful of powder at the great nose, and Nathair inhales a bit, steps back, then sneezes. Gaspar and the girl are knocked over, covered in snot. You try to trick Nathair? The giant throws its head back, laughing. Oh, okay, uh, all right. Uh, let's try the other thing. Here. Aggie produces the stone gargoyle from the artifactory. It animates and begins to fly, a leather strap hanging from it. Gaspar grabs the strap and is lifted off his feet like a child with a bundle of balloons, the bag in his other hand. Just as he is above Nathair's foul, laughing open mouth, he closes his eyes, lets go, and falls inside. The Colossus chokes and grabs at his throat. Inside the Colossus of Elorn, Gaspar screams as he drops through the monster's viscous digestive tract, powder streaming around him. The bodies of men seem to form in the entrails and reach out for him as he falls, moaning. It is absolutely disgusting. From the whorehouse, Dorothy and the goons look up as the Colossus seizes its chest and spits gouts of blood. Miraculously, the evil Lambents died in the eyes of the monster as it imbibed Gaspard's powders. We hear and see as described. His lifted hands fell lifelessly to his sides. The anger was erased from the mighty, contorted mask. And with drowsy, lurching steps, the giant turned his back to the cathedral and retraced his way through the devastated city. He muttered dreamily to himself as he went and people who heard him swore that the voice was no longer the awful, thunder-swollen voice of Nathair, but the tones and accents of a multitude of men, amid which the voices of certain of the ravished dead were recognizable. And the voice of Nathair himself, no louder now than in life, was heard at intervals through the manifold mutterings, as if protesting angrily. The sun moves down in the sky as we see The Colossus went to and fro for many hours, searching, as people thought, for the various tombs and graves from which the hundreds of bodies that had composed it had been so foully reft. But there was no grave anywhere in which the dead Colossus could lie down. Towards evening, men saw it from afar on the red rim of the sky, digging with its hands beside the river. There, in a self-made grave, the Colossus laid itself down and did not rise again. We hear the remaining pupils screaming as the thing comes to rest on its back. The pupils of Nathair, it was believed, unable to descend from their basket, were crushed beneath the mighty body. Cut to the small, half-crushed chapel. Gaspard was found in the church of St. Zenobi later that day, where the Colossus had buried the church beneath a mountain of ordure in its quest for a grave. As if in a final act of mindless defiance. <laughs> Gaspar emerges, covered in blood and excrement, looking insane. A moment as he looks at himself, realizing he's alive. In its resting place, the sun passes over the giant's corpse as it time-lapse rots. For many days, no one dared approach the place where the corpse lay uncovered in its self-dug grave. And so the thing rotted prodigiously beneath the summer sun, breeding a mighty stench that wrought pestilence in that portion of Averon. And so, in the end, Nathair's plan came to fruition. Although the artifactor's tower remained standing, and Gaspard did not stay to rule over the blasted and blighted land. In the monastery gardens, Gaspard, clean, a streak of grey in his hair, walks toward his brother with Aggie and Magnifique at his side. Bernard embraces them, other monks working around him. The gardens are lush, and the monastery is being rebuilt. They walk to the edge of the valley, looking out over the ruins of the castle in the distance. She said she couldn't use her mirrors anymore, but that you'd find her on the other side of Yalorn. Stefan went along. The other side of Yalorn. Then that's where we'll go. He looks to Aggie, who nods. We see he and the girl set out with Magnifique, red on the saddle with them. Of Gaspard Dunod, who had been the savior of the province, 
It was related that he lived in much honor to a ripe age, being the one sorcerer of that region who at no time incurred the disapprobation of the church. The apothecary continues to write, now in a rebuilt, much nicer shop. However, I happen to know some details of Gaspard's further journeys. His vicious encounters with the werewolf Jacques, the Lucaru, and the creatures he faced in his quest for his lost love, Isterel. For much is known to the apothecary. But that is for the next volume of the Apothecary Mysteries. As for this story, it's... We see his hand write the words on the page. The end. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for tuning into our souped-up staged reading of The Colossus, brought to you by HPPodcraft.com. Strange studies of strange stories with Chris Lackey and Chad Pfeiffer in association with Witch House Media. The Colossus was written, directed, and scored by Chad Pfeiffer, with additional audio production by Eric Peabody of Viking Guitar Productions, and is based on the short story The Colossus of Elorn by Clark Ashton Smith. This production also featured the tracks Hellions and Blasphemy by Pitch Black Manor, as well as Obliterator by Viking Guitar. The Colossus stars Andrew Lehman as the movie, Chris Lackey as Bernard and the Angry Dad, Hal Lublin as the Apothecary, Jamie Andrews as Isterel, Greg Johnson as Stefan and Nathair. Heather Clinky as Aggie, Dorothy, and the Old Woman. Chad Pfeiffer as Gaspar, the Enchanter, and Jacques Leloup Guru. Rachel Lackey as Cosette and the Lady du Nord. Levi Nunez as Grandpapa, Red, Pierre, and the Custodian. Bill Sebastian as the Cleric. Andrew Staten as the Marquis du Nord and Goon Number One. Eric Peabody as Teophile and Goon Number Two. Andreas Olivaria as the Abbot. KJ Middlebrooks as Jehan. Scott McDonnell as Mr. Daring. Megan Austin Oberly as Mrs. Daring. Joshua Bentley as the Naysayer. Jeff C. Carter as Big Ears. Dana Pupkin as Sephora. And Andrew Lehman once again as the Sexton. Thank you so much to the listeners of Strange Studies of Strange Stories, a.k.a. the H.P. Lovecraft Literary Podcast. Tell us if you liked this and share it far and wide. No tiny demons were harmed in the making of this film. HPPodcast.com